Welcome to the show. I am super excited about today's guest, Ron English. Ron has been dubbed the godfather of street art and one of the most prolific and recognizable artists alive today. Ron has bombed the global landscape with unforgettable images on the street, in museums, movies, books, and television, you name it, he's been there. You came from pretty humble beginnings growing up in Illinois. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Um, well, my dad was a factory worker. Um, yeah, sadly, like, they were doing something with chemicals, so like everybody in their department died of uh, brain tumors. Um, um, but you know, he, he quit. He quit. Quit when I was about seventeen or eighteen or something, and then uh, moved south. And then from then on, he kind of worked for minimum wage. So he had kind of a hard life. Wow. It's interesting because you know, of course, they didn't want me to be an artist because they didn't know what that was, or it, it was just like an insane thing to be to them. So, but I guess you know, if they wanted me to work at the chemical plant, right. I would be dead now. So I guess I don't have to worry about if I made the wrong decision. Right. I mean, what kind of drew you towards art in those early days, especially, you know, coming from a family with a, you know, a parent as a factory worker? Was there something that happened in your early days that kind of led you down that path? Um, I just always liked art. Um, you know, I, it's hard to say if, if you were like born an artist or if, you know, maybe it's something that you did and you were good at. So you got a lot of good attention for. Right. Like, you know, like I would sit under the table at my grandmother's house and draw my cousin's pictures and. Um, and it was just something I was always obsessed with. I mean, you know, I feel like that people are just born artists. Mm -hmm. It's like people are born gay and you can either say, I'm going to do everything I can not to be an artist and be something else and be a miserable person. Or you can think, now, how am I going to make this work? Right. And it's interesting for somebody like me because I didn't know who Andy Warhol was. I didn't know anything about art history. I was kind of isolated from mm -hmm. everything. And you, know, you got to remember, this is before the Internet or or. You just there was no way a, a kid from a small town in the Midwest was going to really know anything except that they were an artist. So, so it was a long journey for me to figure out how to go about being an artist. Where I think with young artists today, they they they're just so much smarter and they have so much more information mm. and more access to the world than I think anybody did back then. Don't you think that that can sometimes be a negative though? Because you've got so we have so much information and so much, um, you know. I know for me, I see so much artwork that sometimes it can be intimidating to actually go and create my own artwork because of that self-doubt. Right. When, um, when I, I moved to Texas and um, I liked this band, Pink Floyd. They were small doing a band. <laughs> What's that? Just a small band. Yeah. But they did this <laughs> concert called The Wall and mm -hmm. it was in New York and in L.A. And I became obsessed with seeing it. So I flew out to L.A. and saw it. And then I stopped making art for like eight months because, I mean, wow. it was... It was just incredible, you know, with the mix of uh, music and art and the mm -hmm. giant inflatables. And, and, and I guess at that tender young age, I just felt like I could never do anything like that. I could never mm -hmm. pull anything off like that. And you're not really capable of, you know, putting the whole puzzle together and realizing, well, they didn't become Pink Floyd overnight. Right. And, um, and also, you know, to put together something like that, that was that destroyed the band. That was the last thing they ever did. Right. So that was kind of a, the accumulation of lifetime worth of work. Yeah. You know, and it wasn't something, so some, you know, 17 year old kid wasn't going to do that. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. Absolutely. So, but so um, it sounds like music was a big influence on your career. Yeah. And it's kind of funny because I feel like now I'm, I'm at that point where I'm making shows mm -hmm. like The Wall. So like for years and years, I also made music and um, I feel like only in the last few years have I really, really got a handle on it and I'm really able to create you know, what I need to create. Mm -hmm. And kind of like with Pink Floyd, you know, that Roger Waters wasn't going to be able to make all those characters look like they did, mm -hmm. you know. So he had to find people to collaborate with to be Pink Floyd and, and also to create that art. And that's right. kind of what happened to me is, is as good as I am as some of this stuff, you know, I have to have all people like very high level um, collaborators, especially mm -hmm. to do music and stuff. So, so it kind of took me a lifetime to find the right people to pull off this kind of stuff. Absolutely, and it's and it takes a village, right? It's not something yeah, that you, you yeah. do alone. It takes, it takes a village of geniuses. <laughs> right. <Yeah. laughs> so, what were some of just going back a little bit to to your early days? What were some of the um, uh, apart from the obvious challenges? But how did you kind of even begin to create art with limited resources, limited influences? What what was your medium? What did you actually start out with? Mm. Well, the, you know, the first thing I did, um, which was kind of helpful to. Uh, 
throughout my life was I made movies. And then you have to kind of show the movies. So, like, how do you show the movies? Well, I figured out that, you know, I could throw these parties and um, show the movies at parties. There was no sound, which meant that I also had to be a performer. So I had to get up and narrate the movies. And, uh, you know, so I would put slot them between bands. So, but that, that kind of taught me how to throw events and that, you know, that art was an experience. It's mm-hmm. art show business, you know. And right. it may be at the end of the day it's a collectible object that only one person can own and and then resell, and there's that whole aspect of it. But, you know, the the show and everything else is, it's a show. Mm-hmm. That's why I call it a show. So so I think I learned that early. And then um, I met this eccentric guy. Actually, I was making a job for $4 an hour at a bowling alley, and I went to take a job for this guy for $2 an hour because the job was uh, being an artist. And um, one of the things he had me do was do underground comic books to – you know, so he could put his ads in the underground comic books and we'd distribute them to the, the small towns around Illinois. So Perfect. that was fun too, yeah. So you still had kind of your hand in something creative, even though, you know, you were yeah. trying to well, pay yeah, rent. It's like, <laughs> I, le- I learned a lot on day one because, you know, I, I was a very, you know, closed person about my art. Most of my friends didn't even know I, I, I did the, the art stuff at the time. And, uh, you know, so I come in and he goes like, well, we, I'm, I, could you do like a guy playing guitar, you know, maybe amplify the perspective or something? Mm-hmm. And I'm like, yeah, I think I could do that. So, um, you know, I got some uh, circus magazines at home and, you know, that, that that was the music magazine. So I'll get some good pictures of guitars and people playing it so I can get their fingers right. And, and um, you know, I could probably have it to you by tomorrow or the next day. And he's looking at me and says, well, you know, the guy, it's for a T-shirt for this uh, guitar shop called Axe in Hand. And the guy's literally in his car coming to get the art right <laughs> now. Um, so, yeah, I think two days is not going to work. Oh, wow. Like, let it take 20 minutes. And, um, and I was so scared. And I, you know, 20 minutes later, I had a quite extraordinary drawing. So I guess it was in me. Wow. Then I got to see it like walking around town on t-shirts. That's so amazing. That was, but it also taught me that, you know, you can't just like find reasons or, you know, the perfect situation to create mm. art in. Right. So I just came back from Asia and, um, you know, I do a lot of outdoor murals and stuff, but this was kind of a indoor mural in a, so I thought it would be, you know, pretty easy, but actually the building was under construction, so there mm. was dust everywhere, and they were testing the, uh, all the sirens and the, you know, please leave building now. This is an emergency. This is not a test. So like the oh, whole time, geez. there was no lighting. The lighting was just flashing red lights and. Wow, totally. So uh, can't say, hey, you know, like when you guys get this all together in a couple of months, I'll come back and I'll paint it under proper conditions. Right. You know, like something else in a couple of months, so you just have to deal with it. You right. Know? Yeah, that's that's stressful. <laughs> no one, no artist wants to paint under that much pressure. Yeah, so. but I think most street artists have you know painted in the rain or the sleet, the snow, uh, right. the sun. You know, it's it's not you're not under optimum conditions. Right. You know, and it does make you appreciate you know your studio back mm-hmm. home because you do create the perfect space. Right. Actually, you know, for talking about young artists like. When I went to graduate school, you know, a guy took me aside and he goes, your studio should be the most magical place on earth. If you like music, you should have the best stereo. If you like to watch TV or, you know, listen to TV in the background, you should have a TV right there. Um, You should have plants. It should just be a place where you just want to go because you'll just spend so much time there Mm. and you present going there. You'll want to go there. And uh, do you have that that today? Yeah. Yeah. And it's 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 I built it in my house. So. Because I also found that if, if I have to go across town, I might find some excuse mm-hmm. for the world. Yep. But if, if it's just, you know, I walk 20 feet, um, it, you know, it actually, actually gives you an extra two hours a day, too, because you don't commute right. or, you know. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. I you mean, can go to dinner and then come back and work for a few more hours. That's amazing. Working with somewhere else, you might not. Right. But, I mean, thinking about stuff like that when you're young really, I think, pays off. Mm. You know, make, making it as easy on yourself as possible. How does kind of a day in your in your life look? Do you get much time in the studio today with this grueling travel and you know everybody wants a piece of you do you actually get to spend enough time in the studio yeah yeah um and when i'm home i get up when i just i actually don't have an alarm i haven't had an alarm my whole life so <laughs> whenever the sun comes up i get up and i start painting um that's awesome because so i can get a few hours in before the day actually starts around mm-hmm. here because everybody else everything else seems to start around 10 o'clock here and then so usually if i'm up at six or five I've already got a lot done before anything happens. That's great. And um, I write the songs on the planes, so I have a lot of time. You know, that, so I use that time to do that. And I design all the toys in hotel rooms. Wow. You know, so I, I, I use these different spaces to do different things. 
what do you design on today? Do you design on, do you hand draw the, the characters or do you, do you work on yeah. a digital? You do. Yeah. You, you need to draw it from every angle. Right. Um, usually I go, you know, for a couple of weeks a year to China where they, and, and work with the designers. Like, so they've already got it and they've already started to work on it, but I just make sure it's the way it's supposed to be. That's fantastic. So you mentioned in just, just briefly there that, you know, you uh, were at the university of Texas, you, Got your MFA. I, I just wanted to. I have a statistic here. It says, according to the College Board, tuition fees and private universities cost has risen uh, to an average of thirty four thousand a year, and it's predicted that four years in a private college could cost as much as four hundred and eighty seven thousand in twenty thirty five. It's just this astronomical amount of money in the U.S. to get you know a formal education. How important do you feel it is for an artist today to actually get an MFA? And how did it open doors for you that may have otherwise been closed? Mm. It didn't open any doors. Okay. Um, I think that, um, if, you know, like when I was going to school, the art scene was in New York City. Mm. So people I knew that went to schools around New York City would get picked up by galleries because the galleries would go look at the, the mm. graduate work. And so... They didn't pick everybody. They picked a small amount of the people, but I think it worked out very well for those people. Mm -hmm. um, I think when you go to school somewhere in Texas, it's kind of isolating. So that's not going to be what you get from it. You're not going to necessarily get connections. You're going to get something else. Um, it, it's, it's a hard thing because, you know, I, I feel sorry for these kids. I don't know how they deal with that because you don't, in the beginning of your career, you, you don't tend to make very much money at all. Do you know what I mean? Right. I mean, you starve at the beginning and then you get rich at the end. But, uh, yeah, I don't know how they're going to deal with that, and mm -hmm. I feel very sorry for them. Um, once I went to give a lecture at a film school, I, something's kind of wrong with me. I, I don't have proper filters. <laughs> so, like, halfway through the lecture, you know, somebody says, well, well, you know, could you give us advice? And I said, do you really want real advice? I would say, you know, take whatever money you're spending on this film school, you know, put it back in your pocket, quit film school, and make a movie. Wow. And, you know, what will happen when you make a movie, you'll take it to film festivals, you meet other people that make movies, mm -hmm. you'll have to interface with other people to be your best boy and to help you make the movie, and then you go help them make their movie, so you'll learn all the all the, the different things that one would do in a movie, and you'll, you'll actually have something, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and you'll learn the same stuff you're learning here, because you'll have to learn it. Right. And they actually dragged me off the stage, and they were like, <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> you know, it's our gig, oh man. Gosh. Like, oh, God, I'm so Get sorry. out! <laughs> yeah, I said that, I, but, you know. Wow. I think it's really good to have the basics. So I think I would struggle through a certain amount of school. Um, I regret it, you know, going to graduate school in retrospective because, you know, I was scared to come to New York. I thought that mm -hmm. would give me time to really refine my skills and not worry about math and English and everything else that mm -hmm. you have to worry about. Um, but if I had to go back in time, I would just skip it and go straight to New York. Wow. You know, because I'd just be making art there, except then I'd be, you know, selling it in galleries and showing it in. And hanging out with other artists and learning from them. Right. I guess it's kind of a theory versus practical application. And the art world's like wildly different than it was when I first mm -hmm. got into it. It was very small, um, very dogmatic in what it was going to call art or who was going to get to be an right. artist. Um, I don't even, it, yeah, it's like there's so many different art worlds and there's so many different ways to be an artist now that it's, I mean, I know that there's the, the burden of school and you know, hopefully that will let somebody that will do something about that because mm -hmm. that's you just, you know, these kids are getting robbed. It's insane. If they were getting robbed on the streets like that, we would be putting people in prison. Right. You know? Absolutely. So you mentioned that you moved to New York. What was there something that, that you know, encouraged that, that cross country move? You... Oh, I think that, you know, my plan was to go to graduate school and then go to New York. Mm. And, and the idea of graduate school is that if I failed, then I would be a teacher. And a teacher was like a, a, a wonderful job back then because everybody got tenured and got paid a decent amount of money and got summers off. And um, I mean, not it's not today. that any, they're all adjunct now, so it's, I don't right. think it's, it's even a good job anymore. But back then, it was like probably the best job I'd ever seen in my life. So mm. I was thinking, you know, my fallback position would be, you know, quite sweet. Mm -hmm. um, and at one point, I did try to go get a teaching job and they wouldn't give it to me. To, and, and and what actually happened was it came down to me and like one, one other person and uh, 
you know, two other people. So one of the one of the persons had shown at Barry Boone Gallery. So I, I figured, you know, because I called them up and I said, you picked that person, right? They're like, actually, no, we picked the person with the most teaching experience. Oh, wow. And, and we didn't like you. And I'm going to tell you why we didn't like you. You came in and you showed us some slides. We asked you, is this 15 years worth of work? You looked puzzled and said, no, that's eight months worth of work. And we, we knew that you would just be, you wouldn't, you would be, you would go insane here because we just have meetings. Nobody makes that wow. much art. Wow. You know, this is something else. And it, it, you look like somebody that just needed to make art. And wow. so, so I didn't know at the time that they did me a favor. They were right. <laughs> I had two kids. And I was thinking I need money right. for insurance or whatever. And, but yeah, so, but I, yeah, but I'm a lot better off. You know, it's kind of like my philosophy of life is, um, you know, God's always looking out for you. And, uh, it just, it's hard to tell sometimes, like, mm -hmm. you know, yep. you know, sometimes it seems like you're being punished, but you're actually being set up for something better in the big picture. Yep. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I read online that you actually, um, when you came to New York, you were apprenticed for some artists, but I couldn't find anywhere who you were apprenticed for. Oh, um, <laughs> yeah. Well, first I was a truck driver and then I topped a truck oh. and their name is mud. Your name is mud. Wow. You know, I went to work for another trucking company and a few months into it. I was actually doing quite good for him. And then he came in one day and goes, you're a fucking topper. Oh. <laughs> I know. <laughs> it wasn't my fault. It wasn't my day to drive. I mean, I got a lot of excuses, but they, they had us out in the country. They sent us a bad map. We were lost. Um, it was before the internet or cell phones or anything. Right. Um, there was a bridge. It was unmarked. We, I drove up to the bridge. I go, the truck fits. And then we just started driving into the bridge, and it got more narrow oh as we went in and smashed <laughs> the top of the truck. And, and once you've done that, that's just the Rubicon you can't cross yep. as a trucker. So um, so then I thought, well, then I'll go work for uh, other artists. Mm -hmm. So uh, I worked for uh, Mark Astavi, Marsha Gilligan King, um, Bronnie Catrone. But wow. the idea was that, you know, I need to make a living, mm -hmm. and I'd rather be learning my chops, you know. Right. I even went, went to work at one of those, like, starving artist factories, but... Do you but feel, you, you know, and even with, with Mark Kastabi, his style is very simple and easy to do. And I could literally make like a four by six foot painting in like three or four hours. Mm -hmm. um, Cause his, his kind of thing was he wanted to be like Keith Haring. He wants something you could do really quick. And then somebody said, you know, you could even get other people to paint them. You know, right. they're pretty easy to do. But then he started wanting to have like Rembrandts and stuff in the paintings. Like maybe the, the characters were mm -hmm. buying a brand or something. So it gave me a chance to paint really difficult things. And it was, there was this guy, uh, Claude Sakara, who sat next to me, who was a classically trained painter. So, like, I would think, I don't understand how Rembrandt did glazes. And he goes, oh, well, here's his formula. And then he kind of walked me through it. Hmm. But, you know, they, in art school, they just teach you about theory. They don't really teach you how to paint. So, for me, that was like learning a lot of different pa painting techniques. That was really great. Even the, even the art factory taught me a lot, you know, taught me a lot rather quickly. So. Hmm. But that's the greatest thing you can have if you're struggling with something and be able to look to the guy next to you and goes, I don't understand how they how he right. did this. And he goes, Ask. Oh, I'll show you. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> you know, that's that's magic, you know. How do you how do you think an artist out there today could could kind of uh, identify these opportunities or you know, how would they even go about reaching out to an artist to apprentice with? Oh, I I, I suppose they're they're all online or there mm -hmm. it seems like everybody's very reachable now. Mm -hmm. Um is it something you've done yourself? Well, usually like what I tell my kids or young people is, is you know, your job, is, nobody's, these people aren't your parents. Mm -hmm. you know, we're here to do anything for you. We'll fall all over ourselves and act like idiots trying to help you. <laughs> but that's not their purpose in life. Their purpose is to do whatever it is they're doing. Mm -hmm. If it's creating art, they're trying to create the best art, you know, on a timeline. Um, if you could go in and help them, you know, and make yourself very valuable to them, mm -hmm. then they're going to love you, you know, right. and, and, the, and they're going to... Um, they're going to end up helping you because it's artists don't have a lot of assistance. You know, a few do, but mo most of them don't. Most of them, you know, do it themselves and have people kind of assisting with small things. Um, so, like for instance, I had I've had a few different assistants, and usually I had just have one at a time. But but this one guy, Bo Stanton, worked for me, and, and I thought he he got it better than anybody. Um, when I was interviewing, um, the person before him showed up a half an hour late, and he showed up a half an hour early, so they were at the same time. And obviously, she was like, "Goodbye." <laughs> <laughs> and, and I looked at his portfolio, and he wasn't great yet, but mm. you could tell he was on his way, and right. he was trying really hard. And um, I said, you know, do you travel? Because we would have to travel a lot. We might have to do, like, large-scale paintings on buildings. And, and he was, everything was, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, and it, 
he went with me around the world to all these different places, met everybody. Was He knew how to play the game for some reason. So, like, he would always be quiet. He'd go to the big artist dinner after the project. And at the very end, everything was there to help Ron up until, you know, the very last dinner. And then I'd give him the nod, and then he would show all the museum directors and stuff his art. And they would say, mm-hmm. wow, you're so sweet. You were so respectful. You were so helpful. Wow. And, my God, you're a good artist. Mm -hmm. And now he's out on that circuit, you know, doing the same thing. That's amazing. It's also um, a weird thing happened is he came to work for me when the economy crashed. Mm -hmm. And so um, I moved upstate, and, you know, I said goodbye to him. And he's like, I don't think I can get another job, man. I said, well, if you're willing to, you know, come for an hour or half upstate, you can can just stay with us for the week or for however long, you know, Mm -hmm. that you work. And we we had an extra room for him. So he would just come live with us for half the week and then go do his art for half the week. And he became our son. You know, my kids think of him as their brother. Wow. And me and my wife think of him as, like, another one of our kids, you know. That's and incredible. So, and he's obviously having a good measure of success now himself. He's a lot of success. And, you know, he's getting into his scrapes out there. And um, he uses my wife as his advisor. So, like, when he gets illegal scrapes or things that, that happen to artists. Mm-hmm. But, but I, I don't know who you would reach out to to ask because I think it's an experience that, uh, or a lot of the experiences are unique to mm-hmm. being famous artist so right. probably not a lot of people can call up and a lot of his contemporaries are doing very well would probably not want to help them because they're too competitive mm. but she'll like totally help them you know and that's amazing it's so much i hear so much from people who've had success it's all about relationships in this profession the people you meet are amazing mm. they're, everybody blows your mind everybody's a mind-blowing person in your life everybody's at the top of their game mm. so you know and i always kind of thought of it's like your art is this weird magical passport into this world that, you know, like some, you know, poor factory worker's son from Illinois should not be in. You know what I mean? <laughs> but like, you know, I just came off the trip and most, most of the, you know, I would say half the people I hung out with were billionaires, you know, wow. and, and they, they had created all the, a lot of this wealth themselves, you know, wow. and, and it's from their, their brain power and they're, you know, paying attention to the world and, and knowing what to do. And, That's incredible. You know, but it's like, it, you know, you talk. You sit down and you're having a discussion about finance with the, the head of the Bank of Canada. Or, do you know what I mean? <laughs> so, like, you know, you're, you're talking science with scientists who've actually invented and done things, you know. Wow. And so you don't have some weird, messed up idea of what the world is. You mm-hmm. kind of have a pretty damn good idea of what the world is, you know, and what's real and what's not. It's so, incredible. Was there a moment? So all these uh, personal connections are, are amazing, you know. Right. And lasting, not, I'm and, sure restaurants and the food and the <laughs> yeah was there a moment in your career that kind of felt like a tipping point where you were like okay this is i you know this is real this is success this is happening and and how did you how did it impact you creatively um i i i was told that um look if you don't have a gallery by the time you're 27 or let's say 30 um you're never going to get a gallery that's not going to happen that's off mm-hmm. the tape because uh, they like to pick young people and just kind of a bit like music you want them younger when they're willing to work harder and take less money or whatever um yeah so like i hit 30 and uh and i didn't it wasn't working out so i thought well so i'm not going to have a gallery but that was good for me because i thought well now now what what could i do on my own you know i meet a lot of rich people at parties and maybe i could sell them paintings and uh and then it seemed like a big thing that was happening was um uh absolute vodka was like doing absolute warhol absolute Mm. hair absolute sharp I thought, boy, if those absolute English, that would that would really help. And I um, I wrote for uh, Detour magazine. I don't mm-hmm. even know if it's still around, um, but I wrote under an alias so I could just sort of write about like the New York art scene. And I I don't know why I wrote under an alias. I I'd use the <laughs> alias to do all the billboards in the um, in the 80s, just so that it was just harder to catch me if you didn't really know who I was. Right. But um, so uh, I called up and I said I want to do an interview with Michelle Rue. They they researched my alias, Randall Hart, and they said, oh, yeah, really good writer, a lot of, does a lot of high-profile stuff. Um, yeah, he'll do an interview with you. And then so I came to do the interview, and halfway through the interview, I like, you know, I have to t- confess something. I'm, uh, I'm a fake. And, and then I pulled out a painting, my absolute English painting, and I said, what I really want is I want to be an absolute artist. And he goes, yeah, you got a lot of chutzpah, but you know, <laughs> I, you know how I got to where I was? Same way, <laughs> you wow. know? And, uh, and he goes, let's see some of your other work. And he bought like six paintings off of me and gave me an absolute ad. And so if there was a turning point, that was that was definitely it. Mm. 
a lot of people that would, yeah, it was weird. Like when you first moved to New York, you'll see somebody at an opening and you walk up to them and they're not talking to anybody. And you go, hey, how do you like the art show? And they will go, huh. And then they would, they'll just turn their back on you. And, you know, because they can't be seen talking to the wrong person. Mm -hmm. and you might see the wrong person. And all those people that snubbed me, like, as soon as I got the absolute ad, they all had their arms around me and they were my best friend. Wow. <laughs> the art world can be like, so That was the moment that changed everything. It was that absolute ad. When that came out, everything was suddenly different from now. Wow. And your career is just kind of blown up. I mean, you just reading your bio, I'm like, I can't fit it all in the introduction <laughs> so much. So, I mean, what has been the highlight for you? I guess as an artist oh. so far. Well, now now it seems like like it's 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 something way beyond me. Mm. The, most of my career, I was just having shows and doing. It was like I, I felt like I was in control of everything. Mm -hmm. But I, I at this point, I don't. I feel like this this whole thing is way bigger than me. Mm. You know, like all the clothing and the toys and the the licensing deals and it's just endless stuff and. Mm -hmm. you know, Congratulations! It's it's the, amazing. The, the little smiley grin became like this icon in China, and then you got to remember they got ten times more people than us. So it's like, well, yeah, I was doing like um, a thing for some rock star there, and I'm and I I had to say, look, I'm sorry, I don't I don't know who you are. <laughs> you know? I mean, I'll help you with the toy, but I, and then his manager is like, well, you know, he's ten times bigger than Jay Z. Wow. Except only in China, which is ten times bigger than America. Right. So. That's but, wild. Yeah, yeah, it, now it's just it's kind of insane, and it's also makes you realize that um, that you this is how people live after they're dead. You know, mm -hmm. uh, my family could to totally take over, and there's really not well as far as the paintings. You need me to make the paintings, but but you know the the clothing brands and everything else. It's like they just use my assets. Mm -hmm. You know, the assets that I've created over a lifetime that they really don't need me anymore. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. That's incredible. I mean, you've got such a substantial body of work spanning not just paintings across well, multiple. Well, super lucky thing that happened to me is 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 getting a start before the whole thing really exploded. Mm. So, you know, a lot of my stuff is based on ideas, and, and it was ideas that other people were going to eventually have, mm. and I was able to have them first. So I own a lot of iconic ideas. Mm. That you know, obviously somebody else, like five years later or ten years later, was going to have, but but I, now they're mine because I got to them first. So it was almost like a land squat, you know. Mm -hmm. Out of all, the, I mean, you were tr such a trailblazer in terms of murals and street art and characters. But what is, what would you say? Because you have all these creative talents, music as well. What would mm -hmm. you say is like where your heart is invested the most? Um, I like when it all comes together. Like mm. the I did a show two weeks ago in China where it was part painting show, and then you turn the corner and it's an amusement park with mm. giant, you know, some of my characters like, you know, 100 feet tall. Wow. And, and all the characters have songs and, you know, I've developed the characters by using opera singers and different people to, to bring out who they are on these records. So there's the music, so the whole thing feels right. I feel like that mm. I now, now the animals are talking to me and the, and the whole thing is making a kind of sense that it didn't used to make. It's, I feel like that I'm the point now that Pink Floyd was when they did the wall, where mm -hmm. it really brought everything together to one big thing. That's incredible. Amazing. Yeah.